Uh, our next speaker is Joe Perry Clark, talking about Cyberwall. Uh, how am I meant to say that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. I am not particularly au fait with urban youth and their slang. Can I just say more? Yeah, that that's video? fine. That's fine. More metaphor, more money, more problems. Um, most people learn to tune out to buzzwords. However, cyber war is a particularly pernicious, pernicious example. For the last four years, a lot of words have been devoted to terrible, terrible analogies about it. It can be argued that these analogies are dangerous as well as inaccurate for a variety of reasons. But if cyber is not just the fifth commandment, commandment, command of the US, what is it? Is what is the digital Pearl Harbor? I don't know how many people are old school enough to recognise this quote, but I kind of had to put it up anyway, just in case. Um, so I'm Jo, I work as an open source systems administrator, network administrator, I am a security crank, I run part of a, I help run, partly run, a security conference in New Zealand. Um, and I'm also someone who has just outed themselves as crying into their drink <laughs> over bad analogies. <laughs> so an analogy for a bit of background is P and Q are similar. Object P also has property Y, therefore Q has property Y. And why should we care about this exactly? Um, I assert that people make decisions based on their understanding. If their understanding is bad, then the decision will follow on. That will be bad as well. Um, it sort of links into what Denise was talking about, about how your minimizers and qualifications will affect your version of your own competence and how you need to get a reality check where someone will say, well, stop saying just, stop saying, well, I think, that sort of thing. I believe this to be true. You can argue with me, that's fine. Um, but I also think it's important because it makes bad people make bad decisions and this can make for bad legislation, which you don't really have to read all of. It's just I put this one up because it's the one that I think I am most likely to be arrested under. Um, it's New Zealand legislation about um, software, um, distributing software for crime. And the analogy they've clearly used here is, say, drugs or guns. Um, it would be something about sitting two years or something about knowing or being reckless as to whether or not it will be used for the commission of a crime. Um, they've used drugs or guns here, in my opinion, as a, an appropriate analogy in crafting this legislation. Um, to bring up an analogy which I hope is not terrible, I think a more appropriate version would be like a crowbar. It's a dual use tool. You can use it for doing useful things. You can also use it for doing terrible criminal things. But there's no acknowledgement in this bit of legislation that software can be a dual use technology. You can use Nmap, for example, to look at your own network, or you can use Nmap to look at somebody else's network and target vulnerabilities. So, things that cyber war is not. Pretty much everything that you've ever seen in a movie, and in quite a lot of the illustrations that come on the internet. Um, no. That has not scaled properly. Um, this is the first hit for cyber war in Google image search. This is the first image for cyber warrior. No. Um, this is Tavis Ormandy. <laughs> That's what it looks like. He wears ratty StarCraft t-shirts and he filed, I think it was over a thousand Adobe flash bugs in one day. In his spare time, that he did in his spare time for fun. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's a small difference. Oh, this is really not going. Um, so this is some quotes that I pulled from the internet, or they're all from 2002, um, about DDoS. And the persuasive metaphor that is being used here is artillery. Not just artillery, but mercenary armies, heavy artillery. Um, and I, oops, I don't know if I can get this um, all up on the slide deck. What is happening here? Sorry, excuse me. No, it's not going to work, is it? Um, yep, 
yeah, sorry, I'm going to have to let that one go and ask me about my slides later, at which point they will actually be um, useful. Um, so anyway, the persistent metaphor that people are used for this, for DDoS is artillery. People are firing DDoS artilleries at other sites. Um, I really resent this because it's a bad, bad metaphor. It's a bad analogy. Um, this is a Sarajevo rose. Uh, when Sarajevo was being mortared, every time a mortar attack killed somebody, they filled it in with red-tinted concrete. That is what artillery looks like. It kills people. Anonymous hitting, say, the one of the federal site, the Australian federal sites, for a few hours to make a political point and boast about it on Twitter. That is not artillery. This is a section of landscape in France from World War One. That's what artillery looks like a hundred years later. A hundred years later, we might not even have DDoS attacks. <laughs> Nobody knows yet, but it, for a certain date, that kills people. That affects stuff. That DDoS affects it, but not, not like that. And I think it is a grave injustice to some people that we pull that. This um, actually came out just yesterday. This is um, part of Anonymous declaring war um, as a response to the suicide of Aaron Schwartz. And they're clearly using nuclear weapons as a continued metaphor throughout this. <laughs> and you can kind of see, and it kind of has property, and, you, and, and, and no, again, no. Um, collateral damage are civilian casualties. I very, very much doubt as well as this, we're in a, civilians will lose their lives. I very much doubt there. I, there is a big difference between what they are planning to do and radioactive materials sort of like drifting around the landscape in the hands of an activist group. Yeah, that was, this was supposed to be a picture of the Trinity fireball. Clearly is the picture of some of the Trinity fireball, but I, everybody knows what a mushroom cloud looks like. I very much doubt that they're going to do the same thing. So Russia launched an attack on Estonia. It's pretty well attributed to Russian nation state interests. And the speaker for the Estonian parliament, while the Estonian set was doing its thing and rocking along and being quite excellent, a lot of the politicians went <coughs> basically and said a whole lot of very stupid things. That was one of them. As I say again, there is a big difference between a nuclear explosion and a DDoS attack that I think lasted for under a week. Um, the other thing that annoys me is, is if you look at a nuclear explosion, your eyes are going to melt and run down your face. This is a bit of a, a throwaway slide. Um, he says a lot of stupid things and this is being recorded, isn't it? He says a lot of very stupid things and people give him an audience for it. He's like written pieces in the Wall Street Journal. He wrote what I can only really describe as a bit of terror porn that report, um, appeared in the Atlantic about 10 years after 9-11. There will be jihadists everywhere, oh my God. Um, and he also appears in the wired.com cyber war bingo square where is he? Yeah, he's there. These turn up a you know, digital equivalent of something that actually kills people quite often. Cyber Warrior. Um, I actually found this, I think, only a couple of days ago by the time I'd already written most of my talk, but yeah, it was slightly too um, accurate. <laughs> I wish they'd gone some of it wrong, but because this was in 2002, which is you know three years ago now, and people are rattling on about the same things. And you have the digital Pearl Harbor or the cyber Pearl Harbor, and I think Clinton handled this one really well. He lost the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. You know, not, nothing like that. Nothing on that scale has happened yet. So yes, I have an opinion about what it actually is. Surprisingly, it is not in fact a beer. Um, as security con, I run as KiwiCon, and we were like, we just, you want to drink every time somebody says cyber war, so we, we called our beer cyber war. <laughs> it, was, it was actually really good. Um, cyber war has been going on for about <sighs> nearly as old as me. It's over 30 years old. Um, and yeah, 1986, an astronomer called Clifford Stoll um, got us to figure out why there was an accounting mismatch. And it turned out to be that the Russians were stealing data from the US 
state US state computers um, via some German hackers, one of whom later was killed in very suspicious circumstances. Um, so yeah, 1986, it's very old. <laughs> Nearly as old as me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's espionage, it's propaganda, it's sabotage. People have been doing this for literally thousands of years. Um, the fact that people are now doing it in cyberspace does not make it new. Um, I'm not sure how much time I've got left to talk about these things. It is lunch, so you guys, you guys can leave if you want. Half an hour. Yeah, it said I only had... Uh, okay, so, we have the Cuckoo's Ed, we have Ericsson Athens, in which um, one of the telephone inter um, inter exchanges was found to have been bugged. Um, the Prime Minister, among other... and among other members of the government, their telephone, their digi the, sorry, their mobile telephones were found to have been tapped for um, years perhaps. Nobody quite knows because Ericsson wasn't keeping the logs. Um, one of the people that um, I think was a head of telecoms in Greece afterwards killed himself. Um, so that's, that's pretty much straight up espionage. Just because they were doing it with a telephone exchange doesn't make it a completely new thing. People have been being dicks to each other on the international stage for quite some time. As far as propaganda goes, um, Al-Qaeda recruits a lot in the Yemen. They, <laughs> there are message boards, forums, that sort of thing. One of the things the State Department did is own the Google Ads server, or I think it was Man in the Middle, yes, um, and just put up a big US Department of State logo in there instead. And as far as propaganda goes, you're like flipping through your forum reading about the jihad and all of a sudden it's like US Department of State. That was pretty good. So, so the Al-Qaeda website has Google ads? Everything. Yeah, if Google goes evil, we're all so screwed. <laughs> um, yeah. Google AdWords on Al Qaeda recruitment websites, but um, there are people in there are like some of the guys in the mosques saying, "Don't read everything. Don't believe everything you read on the internet." Oh my gosh! That's not AdWords. That's a spy ad. Sorry. That's not AdWords. No. No, it's just spy words. Spy ads. That's why you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm looking. <laughs> So, yeah, so and from going to recruiting onto the internet, they were suddenly having to tell people in person, don't believe everything that you read on the internet, which was a very, very good propaganda victory for the US. And then as far as um, sabotage goes, you've got Stuxnet, which was the Iranian um, cascade of nuclear enrichment. I guess you guys all know about Stuxnet. Yes, no, mostly. Um, the Estonian thing where the Russians DDoS them for a bit. Um, one thing that I found further interesting was um, when Russia invaded Georgia um, in 2008. Um, this is a graph showing um, a spam volumes from a particular botnet um, that has been kind of linked to the Russian business network, although that's kind of um, the bogey, it is the bogeyman in a certain amount of security sectors. Um, but this is a spam drop off point here, and I would invite you guys to guess when the Russian armor was rolling into Georgia and they were trying to jam all of the state communications. So, but I don't know. Yeah, it, it's very hard to prove. Um, it is like, one of the things about cyber war is that it's very easily to be non-attributable to a particular nation state if in fact it is being you know, executed by a particular nation state or whether it's um, organized crime interests or a corporation. So it also is very much unlike everything we've seen before because it is so scalable. Um, the Cutting Sword of Justice, which is like the best name for a group ever, um, it was an Iranian cell, which may or may not have had links to the government, and they took down, I think it was 30,000 um, computer systems belonging to the national Saudi oil company, Saudi Aramco. It vaped the MBR, for instance. They, they couldn't boot, they lost, they got a lot of data out of them, and then they vaped the disk. Um, 30,000 terminals in a brief period of time would be absolutely impossible to do under regular warfare.
conditions. You would, I mean, imagine trying to do that with humans, for example. It is amazingly scalable. Um, it also, as I said before, it, you can have problems in trying to attribute this. Um, Red October is a new thing, a new version of um, worm something. Um, and there are some people are suggesting that it belongs to China or it could be Russian organized crime. So it is very, what's the word I want? Um, advantageous to some state interests and for them to make it appear as if it's coming from somebody else. Um, deniability. Very deniable. Um, again, that doesn't track well with the metaphors we use. If it's a DDoS, you are, you kind of know where that's coming from. So the, the, uh, the, it kind of matches because you kind of are going to tell when an artillery shell is coming. But you don't necessarily know where a worm came from. Um, and there is a lot of things that they can do to blur the forensic analysis when you're trying to track it down. Um, flame, everyone I think assumes at this point that it was the US and Israel, but that's mostly because it's forensically linked to Stuxnet. Some of the stuff matches. Um, and it's also a lot cheaper. You have a look at the Manhattan Project, that look years of work for a lot of very, very smart people. It took millions. I think it was they pulled out all of the silver reserves from the US Treasury and said, oh yeah, we'll give it back afterwards. Or you can hire, I mean, Tavisso did that Apache stuff in his spare time because he could. Um, it's like it, the putting out flame and Stuxnet would be so much cheaper than having a cyber nuclear apocalypse. Um, but it is also, I think, it isn't just an extension of what is already happening. Um, this I borrowed from a friend slash colleague of mine. Um, so this is when Iranian nuclear scientists um, were, had, um, were assassinated, basically. Um, this is a failed one there, but yeah. But you'll notice that there is a gap there, and that didn't work at all. That was supposed to be an arrow, and I fixed it like half an hour ago, and it's annoying. But anyway, yeah, that's when Stuxnet happened. Stuxnet. So they're either assassinating the Iranian nuclear scientists, or they were using a computer worm to also halt the enrichment process. And when Stuxnet got busted, they went back to killing people. I wonder why they weren't just doing both. Even the mill-industrial complex has some budgeting problems sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But the people that the people that wrote this are probably doing something else now that nobody has picked up on yet. Um, Flame, for instance, I think has been lurking around for years before, and I think a couple of security companies actually had samples of, but no one had quite realised what it did yet. And it's only until they found out what it did that they could do anything about it. And Flame is amazingly, amazingly well written. Like someone put some serious logistical um, resources behind that. For, um, and then they found it on May 12th, and I think it was on June the... Was it they found it? Um, about a month after it was ID'd and they put the forensics up on it, it quietly suicided and overwrote all presence of itself on disk. So somebody is thinking very, very hard about these problems. And that sort of, um, what I think, suicide and the um, f f mitigation of forensics, I think is something that it's not easy to have in a non-cyber space. Um, I think the only, I'm trying to avoid analogies in this talk because like most of the thing is like why analogies can be very bad, um, is that um, I think in some places in Africa where genocide is taking place, they've become wary of the UN, um, the UN forensic anthropologist teams doing idea remains, so they've started burning them to reduce the bone fragments and then putting them through some sort of wood, wood chip or something apparatus to make them as small as possible so you can't identify people anymore. 
that is probably a really bad analogy, but it was when I thought of off the top of my head. <laughs> so the other thing that it is, is there's a lot of money in it. Um, if you look at the, um, some of the funding for the US Cyber Command, it's quite frightening. They want to also want to, there was like, um, want to hire a few more thousand cyber warriors. Um, but yeah, it was like, there's 20, US 20 million as far as I can tell to run a wiki and a mailing list, which is something that I guess the anarchists can't really manage, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, the um, Mitchell like O'Connell also appears on the Bingo Square. The guy has been preaching fear, doom and destruction for quite some time and he has a vested interest in it continuing because in 2010 alone they made 34 million off him for doing possibly some actual work, I'm not sure. Um, so what might it be? It's going to be useful for a lot of people. It already is useful for a lot of people. Um, that's probably not going to happen. Um, yeah, there's somebody, um, I think it was in Chinese military academies and also at a web summit in London, they both compared, independently compared cyber war to nuclear war and mooted a non new cyber non-proliferation treaty that would be signed by com um, countries in the UN. <laughs> but again, it's not going to happen. There's too much money at stake for vested interests and yeah, as um, Sky was saying, people with power don't like giving it up. You have like a self-perpetuating bureaucracy where cyber is the thing, and we are. Clear what it would mean. <sighs> there is a cyber mineshaft gap or something. <laughs> yeah. Minecraft gap. I mean, as you said, this doesn't actually kill anybody. Well, it's been more money on cyber warfare and less on other things. I think because it encourages nation states to think of themselves as under siege by spooky and nebulous interests that you can't prove anything about, and speaking. And also, our Could you, could you please wait for the microphone if you've got a question? Yeah. Sorry. And also, there are a bunch of baby killers. <laughs> <laughs> Not particularly fond of middle industrial conflicts. I think they're going to ask you to repeat the question. The question was, should we actually be encouraging this because these weapons don't actually kill anybody and it means less money spent on weapons that do? That's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, I wouldn't... At some extent, I'm from New Zealand. We don't even have a computer emergency response team. We have no cert. So <laughs> we're not doing anything about it anyway. <laughs> You guys have sex, so I guess it's I guess it's serious over here. I was going to say one of their responses is going to be we have to trawl every communication on the internet to check that it's not. Yeah, that was Mitchell Mitchell McConnell wanted to McConnell wanted to rejigger the entire internet so the U.S. government could intercept everything. <laughs> It, it's kind of funny and it's kind of horrifying, I can't decide. Um, there was another general I, who I can't remember the name of that suggested a reasonable um, response to a DDoS artillery thing would be to go kinetic, which means there's a like shorthand for bombing the shit out of somebody. That also scares me. Um, there was also... Oh, there was a motion in the Estonian Parliament as well that they were going to consider it an act of war which would pull in some of the NATO treaty signatories against Russia, which um, I can't imagine possibly going bad at all. <laughs> we'll, we'll wait if, um... No, that was pretty much it, I think. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll take a question now or later, depending on what you want. No, no, it's fine. Okay, so um, we were just talking about the idea of this uh, so-called cyber non-proliferation treaty. But I think that, sorry, I <laughs> no. fundamentally it can't work. No, it can't. you just mentioned before, like with so-called cyber weapons, you don't have 
you have deniability, you don't have attributability. And also it's a lot cheaper yeah. to do yeah, this. And then like, why would they stop it? It's useful. The entire, oh. the entire framework that we have at the moment with nuclear or chemical weapons non-operation yeah. treaties only works because you have inspections, you have yeah. safeguards, you have verification and you can detect if a particular nation yeah. is doing the wrong thing and you yeah. can't do that in the yeah. online network. A lot of the attribute, space. like trying to attribute this is mostly by inference, so Red October um, doesn't, for example, they've inferred, some people have inferred that it's from China because it doesn't hit any of the Chinese nation state targets. It's mostly hitting yeah. Russian targets, even though forensically it has some, and it, it links to maybe Russian organized crime. But why would, I mean, if you're going to sign a treaty saying, oh, we won't do this anymore, what are you going to do when they get smart enough to figure out that you can't prove that it was you anymore? Yeah. So, so that, that metaphor with um, yeah, it, it doesn't with work. Nuclear or chemical weapons fundamentally doesn't work because no. forensics and, and safeguards. Are very and the, the idea that at a Chinese military academy and at a London web so they've independently, as far as I know, come up with the same metaphor and the same suggestion, means that a lot of people with power, think, in my opinion at least, are thinking about this all wrong. Yeah. And also, does this whole problem is it is it not just cyber war, but more generally, it's a problem with any cyber thing. It's, the oh. problem is not cyber war. Yeah, it's, but you have the like, yeah. mill industrial funding Absolutely. when it comes to cyber war and it's kind of, and yeah. then they think about, yeah. I think this, this extension of the metaphor is particularly dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. It's a particularly concerning area, but more broadly, any cyber thing is crap. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was just wondering if we can have a Facebook treaty. <laughs> non-proliferation <laughs> treaty? Or yeah, non the inspectors coming in as like, you have updated in the last day. No. <laughs> um, the other, the question at the very beginning about um, significant or non-infringing use. A lot of these things that could be a DDoS, like a big web server yeah. farm, turn it around and it's an instant DDoS farm. I mean, Google your, could decide to index your site yeah. at infinite speed and your site no longer exists. Yeah, um, or say too aggressive spidering of a small... What's the, um, like the maximum, the max clients of default Apache config is like ludicrously small. So if you go, yeah, so if you go, I've done this awesome thing, everyone should look about it and Twitter it and then everybody does, all of a sudden you've been DDoSed. <laughs> Oh yeah, but that's where I think the artillery thing just it, it, artillery is not really dual use in the same way. But you're old enough to know what slash dot it means. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, they just use for smoke though. Yeah, for actually, smoke that was kind of cool actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, they, they actually retrieved them. Actually, took them out of various smoke fields to take them back to Iraq. Mm. I was just wondering when you were yeah, mentioning the the bad metaphor of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Okay, sure, we know technically it doesn't really make any sense. It's always very easy to weasel around these things. And it's not like people don't try and weasel around oh. nuclear, real nuclear non-proliferation treaties. So is there some value in it, even just um, seeding in people's minds that we agree this is a bad thing and at least at a political level we're saying we're not going to do it so that when someone does find that we haven't been as smart as we thought we were and found out that we were doing it, people would go shame on you at least. To an extent, I think, yes, but on the other way, I think metaphors, they reflect and reinforce how people see the world, and I think it's too, and you see the thing from the Estonian speaker saying it, it was like looking at a nuclear explosion. Mm -hmm. so maybe the idea of a treaty may be okay, but take away all the nuclear language. Yeah, yeah, it's because it's not the same at all. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, they ended it in the word war. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's sort of um, actually one of the analogies that I should have brought up that would have been actually legitimate is the whole rhetoric around the war on drugs, um, like True. which fails for a lot of the same reasons. It's trying to usurp a lot of the language for a situation which it just does not fit.
we can have a war on species extinction or a, or a war to save our climate, that'd be more useful. Well, you guys have got quite a lot of climate going on at the moment, so I think you're losing that war. You're, you're losing the climate gap, I guess. Yep. I have no idea what you're gesturing. Sorry. I've got 10 minutes to go. Um, sorry, does anybody else have any questions, or should we just take an early lunch? Yep. Question? Um, are you seeing any mic? Oh. Okay. Um, do you think that there are people within government or military who are pushing back against this analogy and resisting the use of that as a framework for dealing with this? Yes, but there are probably people like us who are too weird to communicate this to the wider audience. That's a question. Um, so, less snarky answer is yes, almost definitely, but um, it's not what will get a lot of traction in the media. Um, the, like Richard Clark, for example, the article that he wrote in the Wall Street Journal is a lot, um, it's a lot more, more sensationalistic. It's, it is actually a propaganda piece to sell the idea of cyber war. And just and like someone coming along, well, it's not, not actually like that. It's actually kind of like this, and a little bit kind of like that. And it's not as coherent a narrative, I suppose. But it's, a lot, it's a lot harder to argue with actual facts rather than going, oh my god, cyber war, it's a digital Pearl Harbor, we're all going to burn in flames. Cyber flames. <laughs> mm. It doesn't. <laughs> it really doesn't. So. Thank you, Joe.